So uh, a great application of, um, well, really static fluid and pressure stuff has to do with what we call, well, well what are called hydraulics. Okay, so a typical hydraulic system really does not look like this. A typical hydraulic system has a pump in it and a reservoir and stuff like that, but it really works based on this main principle. Really, there are two different sized cylinders like this, each cylinder with a piston in it. Okay, and what will happen is that there's a force applied to what we call the input piston. And therefore, uh, there's a force applied to this thing we call the, whoops, not force, stupid. Try saying one word and writing another output piston. Now, the big deal, like we said, is these two, uh, what do you call them, cylinders have different cross-sectional areas. All right? So, uh, what pops up in here? Oh, yeah, so we apply a force downward, and therefore we move, uh, where's my clicker? We move this one cylinder. All right? <clears throat> a couple ways to think about this. One is, you know, we really ought to start bells ringing. Ideally, we start by talking about, you know, the fluid thing. And here's our isobar where there's some pressure P, right? And if we have a case here where, uh, let me go through this again, but sure, this thing does that. Um, come on. Yeah. Well, what we have is, you know, really, if this fluid, if this cylinder, this sorry, this piston is just sitting there, there's a certain pressure P, you know, just underneath the piston. Well, when we actually push down on this thing, what we get is a change in that pressure, all right? Um, by applying more force, you know, a force F1 to that piston, right? The piston by itself weighs something. Then we apply some more force to that that we'll call F. Well, what we get is uh, a change in pressure, all right? Suddenly there's, you know, an increased pressure here and what that does really is, you know, again, this little increased pressure here by us pushing down, what that does is, um, well, what's described by Pascal's principle. And I'll say that any change, or Pascal's principle says that any change in fluid pressure is transmitted undiminished, undiminished. Throughout the fluid, all right. That's Pascal's principle. So when we, oh yeah. So when we get this force applied here and a little, come on, yep, little change in pressure right here. Well, that gives us a corresponding change in pressure here. And again, this thing weighs what it weighs. But if now there's, you know, its weight, we'll say is, you know equated by this original fluid pressure. But now, on the left, when we've pushed down and made some more pressure here, that makes some more pressure here, and that's going to lift this thing upward. Okay? Now, you might be able to tell that there's a certain volume of fluid that occupies this, well, volume, right? And that volume of fluid is going to stay the same. This fluid is incompressible. Its density can't change. And so, when we push this one down, we've got to maintain the same exact volume. So this one won't go up as high as the other one went downward. Does that make sense? Maintain the same volume. So you know, that's one way to look at it. But the pressure way to look at it, um, if we assume, again, we're going to assume these things start at the same height. They don't end up at the same height. Let's assume that they're at the same height initially. Well, what we can say is that pressure 1 equals pressure 2. Or how about this? Pressure at the input equals pressure at the output. Okay? Well, the pressure is F in over area in. And, well, that's got to equal F out over area out. Fair enough? I mean, that's literally it. This is what you use 
for uh, hydraulics. As simple as that, literally as simple as that. Well, not always as simple as that because this works when input pistons and output pistons are at the exact same height. Okay? So what this says is, you know, how much output force can we get? If we just solve this for output force, I'm going to write it as A out over A in times F in. So we apply some force to the input piston. If the output piston is bigger than the input piston, this is this can be greater than one. This, you know, really ratio. And by whatever ratio the output, or by, by whatever factor the output area is bigger than the input area, well, the output force will be that much bigger than the input force. All right? So let's say that we have a situation where, I don't know, let's give this a radius r. And let's give this a radius, I'd say that looks like 3r. So the question is, how much bigger is the output force than the input force? If the output piston has a three times larger, uh, or a radius that's three times larger. Well, here's what you got to remember. The area goes as pi r out squared and pi r in squared. Oops, not equals, times F in. So all these pi's go away. And this is R squared over 3R, quantity squared. Sorry, other way around, right? Output's bigger. 3R squared over R squared. F out is that. Right? Well, if you notice, sorry, I go over here, that this means F out is 9R squared over R squared times F in. Or, with a three times larger output piston radius, you get a nine times larger output force. Right? Areas R squared so whatever difference or whatever factor, by whatever factor, the areas are, sorry, the radii are different. The areas are different by the square of that factor. Okay? Pretty common sort of a, a multiple choice conceptual question there. All right, let's look at a case where, what's that, what's that? Oh, the log splitter. Sure. You can't click on that, but I can. Here's a, come on, click, wait. Here's a little schematic. Go, go log splitter. Oh, the log splitter. You seen a log splitter? <coughs> um, yeah, log splitter looks like this. Sure, it's got these parts. You put the log here, uh, you jam it in there, and then here's this lever you can pull back and forth. And here's, um, well, really our output cylinder. And this thing is literally a wedge that gets, well, pushed this way and drives through that piece of wood and splits it, right? And here's a great little schematic, whoops, schematic, or animation, I guess, of the splitter. Like I said, typical hydraulic systems have things like tanks where you can hold a lot of excess fluid. They have to have pumps to move the fluid around. There's this, I don't know if they all have these things called spool valves, um, but what happens here Right here's where the the splitter part you know goes, and the wood thing is out here. Well, the wood should be closer, but you get the idea. So we pull this handle. Notice what happens to this spool valve, the spool valve in here. So right now, right, this pump is able to push fluid through here and this way, which pushes the cylinder back. Okay. But now here's where we put the wood in. Now we have the the splitter thing right here, splitter head right there. Here's our tree 
part of a tree that's braced against something laying on a table. And then when we push this spool valve this way, well, it's going to open up uh, another path, a different path for this fluid to take. All right, so watch what happens. Let me erase this path. We close this spool valve. And now, right, you have to have this tank so you can store some excess fluid to move around. But now the fluid goes out here. Uh, no, scratch that. It goes, it's still pumped in the same direction. It goes out here, and now it cranks down here and pushes the cylinder out that way. Okay? And since we give this output cylinder, a much bigger diameter than our input cylinders. We don't need as much force in the pump as we do what we get out. We get out more, we get more force outward or on the output side. Okay? What we do have to do, you might notice if we go back here, is that we got, you know, this much or so upward movement of that piston. We got this, or we had to put in that much downward motion. Okay? You know what actually ends up working? Is that, what, what's going on with this? Fix that letter. Is that F in times D in equals F out times D out. Oh, baby. What is that? That's work. Energy's conserved. Whoops, I should say out. Right? You can't put a certain amount of work in and get more work out. That would um, that would be great, wouldn't it? But you can't do that. So says the law of conservation of energy. Alright? So even though we get more force out, the downside is we have to put more distance, or we have to apply our smaller force over a bigger distance to make that happen. That's why, again, that's why we have this pump. Because the pump serves as a way for us to really kind of almost apply this force to the fluid for a much longer distance than we get, you know, out of the cylinder movement, the output cylinder. Okay? Okay, let's go back to and look at a more complex case, slightly more complex, where the input piston and output piston are at different types. All right? It doesn't always have to be the input is above the output, but it is in this case. So we have a case like this. Here's, uh, well, the input, and here's the output. All right, so we have a P in, we have a P out. Well, we can relate those pressures by, let's see, remember it's always P below is P above plus rho GH. I would highly recommend you get comfortable with the fact that it's below and above. You got to know that. You can't be wondering which one's which. So in our case, in this, in this example, P out is P in plus rho GH. Or F out is F, what am I doing? F out over area out. Is F in over area in plus Rho, G, H. Oh, we're actually trying to solve a problem here. What, in for, what input force is required? Um, well, let's see. Uh, input force. So we're going to say that's F out over area out minus rho G, H is F in over area in. Yeah? Yeah. So, uh, so I'll, I'll pause. You have to listen to me do all the work. Actually, I'll do all the work because why not? So let's see. Uh, area in is going to be pi r squared. So the input, input, input. The piston on the left is a radius of 0 0.0121 meters. 0 0.0210. Uh, so let's see. 
point oh two or one two squared times pi. So this is ah, come on, man. Better four point five times ten to the negative fourth meters times F out. The output plunger as a radius of that. The combined weight of the car and plunger is twenty thousand. 500 newtons. That's what we need for an output force. Area out. Radius of that. So 0.15 squared times pi is 0 0.071. Oh, that's actually, yeah, yeah. This should be a square meter. That's a square meter. Minus, let's see, rho. Hydraulic oil density of that. 800 G H uh, 1.1 meters so let's see we got to do 20,500 divided by 0.071 minus 800, well, 8,000 times 1.1, and then times 4.5 e negative 4. I get that F in is 100. And 26 newtons. Amazing. We get to apply 126 newtons of force to lift something that's tw that weighs 20,000 newtons. That's a lot of bang for your buck. Why the big difference? Well, looky here. That's one. That's a factor of, um, well, more than 10 different, right? A factor of 10 radii differences, or a factor of 10 radii difference will give you a factor of 100 force difference, right? This is more than 10, so, uh, well, and also, we get the advantage of that the pressure down below is bigger than the pressure above anyways, so we get double advantage of this thing, right? So a much, much, much smaller input force than an output force. Yes? That's it, people. Ah, Mr. Warner, that's awesome. I, I, I can't believe it was only 18 minutes. Yeah, I know. It's wonderful. Um, let's see. So, yeah, we'll have some hydraulic problems to work on tomorrow. A little demonstration, I hope. And uh, that's it. Get cranking on that review packet, people. Get cranking. Yes? Yes. Oh, yeah, and I'm going to try to make one of those videos, too. I'm going to give her. See ya.